All right, today on the podcast we have probably our most prestigious guest, in my opinion, uh, Joshua B. Joshua is a physicist, a PhD candidate at Penn State University, an educator, and a power lifter. How are you doing today, Joshua? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Dude, I'm doing awesome. Thank you again for uh, making some time for me. Um, this is a conversation I've wanted to have for quite some time as I'm very interested in the topic of physics. However, I am certainly a layman when it comes to it. So I'm excited for this conversation. So to, so to start us off, can you tell me what physics is? Sure. So for me, physics is just looking at the natural world and trying to predict just about everything that you can see or get data from so is physics math or is math physics so historically they've been pretty intertwined Mm -hmm. um in the old days you know think back to newton there was no just physics or just math you'd learn both of them at the exact same time at this point uh i would say they are their own fields but they're very interconnected to the point where I would say basically any math that comes out eventually will be used in physics. Okay. Uh, And if you were to give advice to yourself or maybe someone that was in your shoes, let's say in high school, who's wanting to eventually pursue a career in physics, do you have any advice for someone like that? Like what, what is one solid piece of advice maybe you wish you had or that you could give to someone else? One of the things that, I like to tell people is first off it is doable a lot of people like to make physics seem to be this mountain that is super super hard to climb but first off it's 100% doable you can just put in the effort and I believe that almost anyone can do physics as long as you put in enough time and effort and then second a lot of times when you're going to learn physics, there is also math that you have to learn. Okay. And my recommendation when you're actually getting down and learning is to learn the math first. Don't actually try to learn the math and the physics at the same time. That's a trap that a lot of people fall into where, you know, let's say uh, you try to learn calculus, especially uh, vectors and multivariable calculus at the same time as learning, let's say, electromagnetism. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to... Uh, distinguish why you're having a trouble with a certain problem is it because you don't know the math is it because you don't know the physics and so my recommendation to everyone is to try and learn as much of the math you need before you even attempt learning the physics because it would just make your life easier so it's almost like and forgive my analogy if it's not accurate but okay let i want to equate it to something i you know i, I stay active uh, i'm an athlete is it one of those things where it's like by getting good at the math is like, let's say you're trying to get a max bench press doing sure. other supplemental exercises helps. So almost like doing the math helps you mm-hmm. understand the physics. Does that make sense? So it's almost like doing yeah. other exercises helps you learn or helps you get a more bench press. However, learning other math helps you understand physics more. Am I understanding yeah. correctly? Yeah. Another example could also be, when trying to do fighting or something, you have to have cardio. And if you never trained cardio beforehand, when you're, you know, if you're sparring with someone and you're out of breath, you don't know if you're doing poorly because you're out of breath or you're just bad at the techniques of actually fighting. Okay. That's, that's actually a really good analogy. That makes sense. Cause uh, yeah, there's a lot of people out there who try to get through it, you know, with brute force, but you know, that makes sense. Uh, you know, one of the things, too, that that got me with it was like growing up, you know, my love for math was extinguished early. But I feel like if it had been maybe stimulated more by the education system, you know, it is something I would have an easier time with. Do you think that the education system kind of sets most people up for failure or do you think it's more of a cultural reason that people are like overwhelmed by math? I think both to be honest with you because there's so many people um that actually have like a sense of pride at being bad at math where they go oh i I could never learn that i'm i'm bad at math and so there's this cultural thing with being bad at math but there's also 
the school system, which isn't necessarily great. Uh, you know, I graduated from a public high school, uh, but even though I had a good time there, I think it's because at the very beginning of my childhood, I think I was a little bit ahead in terms of math. I think my father helped me learn, you know, addition and multiplication early on and just being slightly ahead at the beginning, I think really snowballed me. And unless I was ahead at the very beginning, I don't know how easy math would have been later down the road. And for those who don't have someone who's encouraging you to learn addition and multiplication early, it the school system doesn't pick up that slack. And so it'd be much harder for other people. So essentially it's like you would credit your early learning to your math literacy, like overall through your yes. development. Okay. Yeah. I, I learned multiplication probably when I was in kindergarten and which is a few years earlier yeah. than most people. Yeah. And my daughter's was... eight and she's just now learning it. So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty early. Yeah, it's, it's completely because my dad really pushed me to learn addition and multiplication. And, you know, he didn't have to be too active all throughout elementary school. It's just a little early on, just helping with addition and multiplication. I think that snowballed me. I think you don't have to start learning that early, but that's something that I think in my life helped me. That since I was good at it early in life i enjoyed it more and because it gave I you a sense it, of pride I, later like oh i already yeah. know this type deal yeah and because i because i was good at it i enjoyed it and because i enjoyed it i wanted to do it more which in turn made you even better at it yep okay um and i, I this is going to be a silly question and i didn't have it on the list before but I, I feel like it's it's funny and a good segue into the next part what is your favorite particle and you can take a second Ooh. and think about it. Yeah, so it's going to have to be some fundamental particle. Um, I Fundamental meaning like a building block of other things? Yeah, so in, in physics, in particle physics specifically, there's a list of supposedly fundamental particles according to this theory called the standard model. Now, people think the standard model is incorrect because of a few different reasons but if we were to go off the assumption of the standard model i would probably it either have to be between uh, a photon or a neutrino photon because i like how it works and learning about like the math really of quantum field theory and that's one of the first things you might learn is mm -hmm. electrodynamics which would have the photon which is light but neutrinos I like for the fact that they just really show us that the standard model is wrong in a lot of ways. And so I like that there's a lot of physics that we don't know. Would you say neutrinos. would you say it's almost like a mysterious particle? It's one of those things that we just don't know very much about and it kind of throws a wrench in the standard model. A hundred percent. It we we definitely we know a lot about it, but we don't know the full picture, which is a lot considering we know oh, so much more about the other particles there is not just one thing there's multiple things that we don't understand about the neutrino which is very very surprising big picture ideas of like why is this a thing and, and potentially yeah. could lead to um some explanations for dark matter and for those who don't know um the universe is expanding faster than we can calculate for and long story short there's not an answer in the standard model at least to my understanding for why it's doing that and um would you say that you know that could perhaps be the explanation is there something that we're not seeing is there a force that maybe interacts with the neutrino that causes this you know movement of yeah. these galaxies yeah so dark matter so there's dark matter and dark energy and neutrinos play a a big role in what we're guessing could be some things to do with dark matter. Uh, one of the big candidates, at least in the past, is something called WIMPs, which is mm -hmm. weekly, weekly interacting, interacting massive particle, I believe. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 100%. And I'm, I'm on it. The, yep. And the weekly interacting, that part is referencing to gravity the weak interaction. No, it's actually weak oh. interaction. And that's where the neutrinos come in. And now, so, um, yeah. is there when it comes to um, mass, gravity is 
a natural byproduct. All all mass has gravity, correct? So all mass has gravity. Uh, so yes. would would anti mass potential and not, I'm not talking about anti matter. Mm-hmm. Anti mass. At least I've heard the terms be mutually exclusive before. Um, yeah, those, is yeah. is there a potential force that could be causing the expansion from anti mass, almost like an anti gravity? Is that is there room for that, or is that more just speculation? Um, I think it. So, if there was something that acted anti mass, it should have that type of effect. Now, I'm not a hundred percent sure what would cause an anti-mass thing to, to happen. Uh, but it's definitely possible. Like, if you look at the equations of motion, uh, it should work out. Uh, because it's you could, essentially yeah. based on Newton's laws, since everything does have an equal and opposite reaction, could mm-hmm. that could potentially extend to gravity even? Yeah, 100%. Um, and then um, we've, we've kind of had brief conversations about it before, you know, about like, some exotic means of propulsion that could exist in the future. But if you personally had to put your stock or let's just make a hypothetical investment, you have a hundred billion dollars, right? And your goal is to create FTL faster than light travel. And based on the standard model, that's impossible. Do you have any speculation on a field or an idea that would perhaps go around it because also the standard model does, you know, leave room for like Einstein Rosen bridges, which uh, if you, if the viewers have seen Thor love and thunder, they like talking about the Bifrost as basically a wormhole. But do you think that there is a way to go faster than light? Yeah. So there are ways to make it look like you've gone faster than light. And I think something like a, uh, a wormhole, uh, would be something that you could look into. Mm-hmm. That'd be one of the best ways. Personally, there's a there's a few things that some people like. I know we've talked in the past about Alcubierre drives. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be. I personally wouldn't invest as much in an Alcubierre drive as in trying to look for maybe some signatures of wormholes in nature. And then once we understand about wormholes that could possibly exist in nature, then trying to create one here if possible that's probably how i would go about it um do you think that uh the and forgive me for not remembering the name of the study but the the study that looks for gravitational waves do you think that that is probably our best like segue into finding wormholes or do you think it's going to be from a completely different vector because like you know black holes are arguably well not even really arguably they're the strangest and one of the most strongest phenomena in the universe. Do you think that the answer to wormholes lies there or do you think it lies elsewhere? I think, uh, so the collaboration that's looking at this is the one that's really based in America is called LIGO. LIGO, that's right. Yep. There's LIGO, Virgo, CAGRA, LVK. Those are the ones around the world that are these gravitational wave detectors. And I believe that they do have the ability to try and look for wormholes in the gravitational wave signature. Now, you know, LIGO's about, actually all of them are about to go online again. I Hopefully the end of the year, if I remember right, uh, with an increased sensitivity. And I know there are some physicists, I've talked to one physicist uh, who's interested in looking at that type of stuff. I don't know if he's fully committed to working through the, the theory yet because uh, it takes a lot of time and if you don't discover it, it won't have too many publications. Uh, not publications, but references. Is there still a stigma in academia toward the concept of a wormhole or do you believe that that's one of the concepts that most people accept as being factual and or possible? I would say there is still a stigma. Yeah. So like if, yeah. if, if you tell someone, hey, I'm, I'm going to be investing this much time in working on discovering a wormhole that mostly you're going to kind of get some eye rolls or some people who think you're silly. Yeah, I, I would say so just because what we imagine a wormhole's gravitational wave signature, like if it were to hit something, it would be really hard to distinguish it from just black holes or neutron stars or other compact objects 
And so it would be a very uphill battle to even prove that you have even discovered something like that. And because of that, most people would rather work on something where you can get definite results and say, hey, I've actually, we have found something. I know what that something is and get uh, citations that way. So, so it's almost so far ahead of the um, the meta or where we're at that it's almost like a waste of time to look at. Is that, is that kind of what I'm understanding? Yeah, because in physics, we want to always be able to compare things to data and we just, it's doubtful that we have the needed sensitivity to see wormholes versus, you know, to distinguish a wormhole versus to say two black holes colliding or quasar or anything like that. Just yeah, yeah. super like energetic um, phenomena mm-hmm. happening. Um, so Avi Loeb, he is a physicist uh, out of Harvard and he okay. is the chair of the Galileo project. And I've heard him talk about LIGO a lot because he believes that LIGO is going to be one of the ways that now he's a proponent of extraterrestrials. Uh, let me go on a just quick tangent to kind of set the context. So um, 2016, he discovered Oumuamua, which was an object that was basically not tidally locked with the sun. It came from a different solar system, uh, star system. And <clears throat> it was allegedly very oddly shaped like a disc. Anyway, long story short, this led him to believe that it was basically trash, like alien trash, that it was another civilization's, you know, floating debris. He didn't believe it was a craft or anything like that, but it's, it lit a fire under him. And, you know, Harvard is stereotypically known, you know, as one of the most prestigious schools yeah. in the world. Um, you know, everybody's heard of Harvard, Stanford, those kinds of places. Penn State's up there too, so that's pretty cool, man. Uh, just saying. But anyway, um, yeah. So he it made him, uh, you know, get involved in the Galileo project. Well, the Galileo project is trying to get as many sensors from as many different fields as they can, and they're actually going to be working with LIGO on trying to corroborate data with them that they get. Um, because one of his theories, we were talking about the Alcubier drive for people who, you know, don't know, um, it's essentially, I can explain it like surfing on space time. You, you know, have a gravitationally dense thing in front of you that contracts it. And then you have something behind you that expands it and essentially makes a wave. So you can travel through space time without actually exceeding the speed of light. But anyway, he's thinking about using LIGO. Um, do you think that if, an Alcubier drive was functioning on Earth, like if extraterrestrials were visiting, do you think that, you know, LIGO would be sensitive enough at the moment to be able to detect that? Or do you think that we're a long way away from being able to detect uh, wormholes with LIGO? Okay, so if it was happening on uh, Earth, I think we would be able to actually detect uh, an Alcubier drive. Because if somehow it was able to start and go from it's not moving faster than light to start moving faster than light, it would have a very interesting signature. Just like, for example, on the Richter scale for earthquakes, you can actually tell the difference between an earthquake and a nuke going off. They have different signatures, and you would be able to tell that if something on Earth happened, like an Alcubierre drive, you'd... almost guaranteed be able to see it in the LIGO data and it would look nothing like black hole mergers. Okay. So essentially if it were a ripple in a pond, you could tell the difference between a pebble and a rock, even though they both make a a wave, if you will, like they both are going to have different signatures. Yes. Um, Yeah. I I would definitely say that they would have very different signatures. Um, Is string theory currently feasible in the standard model do you believe that do you believe in string theory do you believe it it works with the current standard model so i do not believe currently that it predicts reality i think the the biggest reason for me is it depends on something called supersymmetry and it predicts these supersymmetric particles which are essentially uh brothers of the current center model particles they are brothers or sisters however you want to look at it and we should have detected them in 
the Large Hadron Collider. Okay. And so because I don't feel like supersymmetry represents reality because of that, and so I don't believe string theory represents reality. Do you think that CERN is going to provide any any usable data? And what I mean by that is like, yeah, it's discovered the Higgs boson and a couple other things, or sorry, applicable. Do you think it's going to have any applicable discovery soon? Because a lot of it so far seems like it's a really expensive science project. And I don't mean to sound ignorant or like I don't appreciate you know, how much um, investment has been done in understanding particle physics through CERN. But do you feel like it's going to produce anything applicable, let's say, in the next 10 years? Okay, so CERN as a whole has plenty of things that aren't the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, okay. The Large Hadron Collider and those particle accelerators, the next generation of them, it's somewhat questionable. The, the reason for that is... The, the last bit of funding was for the late Large Hadron Collider, mm -hmm. and the reason we thought it was good investment as a community, from my understanding, was, hey, we predict the Higgs boson and a bunch of supersymmetric particles. Here's the entire list and the entire energy scales that we should see them at, and we should see all these new particles. And when the Large Hadron Collider came up and we only found the Higgs, it threw a wrench into the plan because now we don't have a really good theory of what we should expect at higher energies. And because of that, we're basically saying, Hey, give us money so that we can maybe find something, but we don't really have a good reasoning for why we should find something right now. Okay. So honestly, finding the Higgs boson, like produced more questions than it answered. Yeah, because if we had found all the supersymmetric particles, we would have been like, wow, we have a really good theory. It predicted all these things. But because we didn't find any of the supersymmetric particles, we have a lot of questions as to, hey, what, what assumption was wrong uh, when we try to do supersymmetry? It, to me, the more I like learn about physics, and I know most people in academia disagree, but the more it makes me believe in like intelligent design because it's just there seem to be so many aha moments, you know, even just over the last hundred years. Um, but my next topic is going to be fringe physics. So we've had a couple conversations before. Uh, I'll name drop a little bit, like Eric Weinstein and Stephen Wolfram. Do you think that fringe physics has a place in the perfect world as far as the progression of physics? Um, because, you know, if you go and look at men like Galileo, you know, he was cursed and mocked and even imprisoned in his own house uh, for believing that we're not the center of the universe. So do you think that any of these people are potentially a Galileo-like figure? Or do you think for the most part they're kind of not really on to anything they don't have a lot to contribute i personally have not been convinced by their arguments but i do think they have an important role in you know the physics community as a large right um why i say that is there can be plenty of people that look at theories that don't pan out right mm -hmm. for example in my opinion string theory even though it did produce a lot of good math maybe the physics wasn't right but I, what I would say in general is, yes, we should have people look into things that may not follow the mainstream ideas because maybe they're onto something. Now, the people that you've listed, I haven't been convinced by them that they're onto something, but I do think it's important that they're out there looking at ideas that may be true. Do you currently think modern academia is healthy or do you think it could use a change? And if you do think it could change, what would you do differently? Okay. So there are, I would say modern academia is currently undergoing several changes. I think they're, they are good. There, there's a few problems. I'll, I'll list a few out. One of the problems, uh, at least from the grad student's perspective, is there's a few standardized tests, like the, the physics GRE, which... Uh, you take at the end of your undergraduate to apply to graduate school. That's being phased out. There's a lot of stuff to do with uh, the graduate student life. Uh, what classes are you're required to take? Why are you required to take them? All those things are being looked at. And so I think 
for the graduate student, a graduate student's life in physics in 10 years, I think will look much different than my life uh, going through grad school. And I think a lot of changes are happening for the better in terms of that. Now, if we look at the professors, I also think the professors are changing somewhat. I have found that a lot of, you have a lot of old grumpy men um, <laughs> in academia right now who are, can be, can be mean at times, to be honest with you. And I think that's also being phased out where they they like to dismiss other people's ideas very quickly. I like how you keep an open mind, even though you don't necessarily agree with Eric Weinstein and Stephen Wolfram. You're at least willing to like you know take their stuff into consideration. Um, so it's good to hear that that kind of like I'm right, you're wrong, and you're stupid mentality is being phased out. Yeah, I so I don't know exactly what caused that mentality or if it's always been like that. Uh, you know, I, th- I think those I, people tend to be more um, assertive when going for a job. And to be honest, when it comes to teaching, you know, it's a thankless a lot. So I kind of think it may attract that personality type sometimes. It's kind of like how, you know, a cop, for example, it's kind of a thankless job. So it attracts two different types of people. It attracts people who genuinely want to help, and then it attracts people who seek to abuse their power. And I think, in a way, teaching is one of those jobs where you can either hold people back or you can really make a difference in someone's life. Yeah, I mean, I I can agree to that. Yeah, I, I also think there's a lot of frustrated people, at least in the field I'm in, because I I do a lot of stuff over the last few years, I've been really interested in high energy theory and high energy theory has had a lot of funding go to string theory and string theory has not panned out the way that they wanted it to. And could so you, you have a lot of, yeah. could, when, uh, could you maybe give us a brief uh, oversight of high energy theory? Sure. So in my opinion, what high energy theory is, is particle physics and gravity are the two biggest proponents of or components of uh high energy theory it's a lot of things that you wouldn't necessarily see the effects in everyday life for example general relativity you don't see the curvature of Mm space-time in your everyday life but when you look at higher energy scales such as the universe as a whole or in these particle colliders you actually do see interesting physics so is it kind of like how um when you go to a small scale you have the plank length and things Mm kind of change do you think it's the same with big stuff like when you get to you know a galactic scale do you think they kind of have a different rule set so it's not quite what i would say a different rule set it's just that at the at So at the everyday scale of life, right, you are able to use a certain amount of, of approximations. Mm-hmm. And for example, gravity, you could do everything using general relativity to explain everyday life of gravity. But it's easier to use Newtonian approximations at the everyday scale. So it's not that GR is wrong at our scale. It's just that it's not the quickest to do to get an answer that works with the data that we have because the effects of general relativity are so small at our everyday life. And when talking about the Planck scale, so one of the other things about high energy is the smaller the distance, for example, the Planck scale, the Planck length, you have to go to very high energies to probe that type of distance. And so Planck length would also be part of high energy as well as, let's say, the universe as a whole would also be high energy. So it High energy covers both of those scales. Okay, so it encompasses both extremes as well as the center. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next question is going to be, so for those viewers who aren't aware and, and most won't be, we, I met you through RuneScape and, you know, I, I obviously upload RuneScape content to my channel. Um, you know, so a lot of the people that I talk to know, know about RuneScape. Each question, everything podcast where I have another RuneScaper on, we're going to, I'm going to ask them a couple questions. So my first one regarding RuneScape, if you were a developer for Jagex, 
what changes or content would you add to explicitly attract new players? I'm going to have three different, it's going to be the same question, but for three different groups. So what would you do to attract new players? What content would you introduce or changes would you make? So for new players, I would probably find some way to teach them the combat system better than it currently is taught. I feel like that's probably one of the biggest hurdles. And I feel like a lot of people don't understand the combat system well. And because of that, have a lot of... uh, So the user interface is what confuses people a lot, I think. And And it doesn't help with the combat system because... You know, you have to use, even if you're using one style, you're still going to use abilities from several different, like, books and styles. So it's almost like the interface being so customizable in combination with the amount of abilities is confusing. Uh, Would you maybe like to see suggested revolution bars, which, for those who don't know what it is, revolution is, like, fully automatic using your abilities. It's like having an automatic car versus a manual. Um, would you would you like to see you know basic revo bar magic one that's already in the game you can click on it'll it'll have it go or do you think we should have maybe a boss where you're rewarded for more mechanics like what would you do though to teach people the combat system and you've taught me a lot because you're way better at pvm than i am and to be honest i've learned a lot about pvm through you but what would you recommend to people who are who are trying to get into runescape and learn the combat system or what changes could jagex make to help people yeah so giving people beginner bars i think could definitely help um that i think that's a good start and then really teaching the the differences between different abilities for example something that people do when they first start playing the game is there's these abilities that come off cooldown really quickly such as rack or slice and they don't do a lot of damage, and that's why they come off cooldown really quickly. And so people, I find, who are just starting out, usually use them as one of their main abilities. And so teaching people why that might not be the case, as well as giving them beginner bars, I think that could help. And then at bosses, it's I feel like there could be some way to teach people how to learn mechanics better but that the problem is i feel like people will have the the higher level people will have some problems with that if that is for like a really tough boss they don't want to be told explicitly how to use mechanics and so there's this hard trade-off there which for bosses and mechanics of how do you appease both the beginners and the more experienced perhaps and i I like that idea um you know of it teaching you the mechanics Perhaps, though, you know, okay, so Zamorak just came out, you know, uh, two months ago, something like that. And when it came out, you know, there was like a world race to get X amount of Enrage on it. Um, Mm -hmm. So what about instead of them releasing the explanation for the mechanics off rip, what if they went through and had like, you know, boss week where while you're there, it'll warn you, hey, this mechanic's about to happen, you know, through a pop-up or, or however maybe you planned it. What if it didn't do it for the new bosses, but maybe went on like a rotation for older ones? Like it's learner week for X boss. Yeah, so I would say, I think that would take away some of the appeal for some of the higher level bosses because, I, I don't know, RuneScape is very weird in this regard that, at least for me, my favorite way of learning how to do a boss is to just bang my head against the wall until mm-hmm. i learn it and that's not very most most people can't do that yeah. would you say yeah. it's it's like well i in my opinion i think it's like their self-criticism like i was taking uh one of our clan mates to elite dungeons too and he's a newer dude he's not real active or anything that wisco guy and it was like he kept like getting frustrated at himself for dying but i didn't care at all i knew it was learner pvm would you say like not being so hard on yourself when failing is like key to getting good? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think Jax is taking a step in that way t- when they're redoing the death cost, uh, because that's something that's really been a hindrance about learning bosses. Is, that was actually hey. my next question. I was going to ask you uh, what, like, just so I can preface the question and then you can continue. Mm-hmm. How would you fix 
death cost in RuneScape. Go ahead. So one of the things that I really like that is an option uh, is so they're implementing a GE tax, and mm -hmm. I have no problem with them implementing a GE tax if that means that death costs go down. In fact, I would be willing to, you know, pay zero for deaths if it meant, you know, I pay a little bit more in uh, tax. Now, that won't help as many people because that really helps PVMers because only PVMers experience death costs while everyone in the community basically uses the GE. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like it's the... It seems like it's inequitous because you're going to have, for example, skillers. If I don't fight anything and death costs aren't an issue, but I sell back ruminal bolts and I sell viswax and I do my dailies and I sell brews, but then it will affect me. So it's kind of like a socialist type perspective. And I, I personally don't really yeah. like the idea. But is but it. Why should PVMers have to essentially have the burden of being the gold sink why aren't skillers also being part of the gold sink for the community because they also are receiving a lion's share of the reward if that's fair it's like kind of like the argument in capitalism they are taking the risk and going and fighting the boss but even though they may lose 10 mil if they die you know they may get you know an item that's worth max cash so that's kind of why i i feel that way i feel like a lot of the community um, and maybe it will force more people to do PVM, but I feel like a lot of the community gets their max cape and maybe kills a couple like simple bosses, goes to God Wars 2, and then that's kind of the game for them. I don't really necessarily know that it would... I don't know. And it, I think it would be good for the economy because any gold sink is good. Ultimately, you know, it takes gold out of the game and adds to the value of what's left. But yeah, I just see skillers being inequitously hurt by it, in my opinion. Um, um. Okay. Uh, but I think this would allow them to get into bossing more because one of the biggest hurdles is oh oh because they wouldn't have death cost. Yeah, because there okay. would be no death cost. For example, never mind. And, I'm following. Right, I got you. Yeah, and because there are death costs right now, that's part of the reason a lot of people don't want to go to bosses because there's some people in the community that are like, oh, I want to have best in slot to go even attempt to boss. But mm -hmm. then they don't want to pay 10 mil per death every time that they die. You know what? I didn't understand that entire time until you said that. No, actually, that that, that makes perfect sense. Um, if you were to add another boss to the game or a piece of content for yourself or for high-level people, what would it be? <laughs> so, uh, I would... Don't, don't say <laughs> true trim. That, uh, so... If we're just saying bossing, right? I'm not talking about true trim, which is what I would add if it was a high level community as a whole. Uh, if it was only a boss, I would add an even harder mode of Frago, which is something that Dragix has looked at in the past. I would just do hard, hard mode Frago. Or you could potentially, if they were to do that, couldn't they do it um, kind of like how they did Next, like where Next and AOD are completely different? Uh. Especially. Yeah, I would, I, yeah, I would do something along that uh, that regard, and I think it would work perfectly into uh, the game. The storyline, yeah. Well, it's yes. almost like you could have Tello, Solak, Virago, all like maybe attack. You know, because the edicts of Guthics are in effect, and Guthics obviously is why Virago and Telos and all those uh, monsters yeah. exist. So there, there's two parts to this, in my opinion. So first off, Virago killed Raksha. And so he would have I would have assumed he would have gotten a power-up from killing Raksha. And then on top of that, one of the next things in the game that's needed would be dual-wield tier 95 weapons. Virago drops dual-wield tier 90 magic, and so hard mode, hard mode Virago could drop the dual-wield tier 95 rather than just the tier 90 that you get from base Virago. I'd like to see them um, be an item where you maybe even had to use seismics to upgrade them. I feel like that's a really good way to like keep certain bosses valuable. Like the and I'll go to another question after this because we've talked about RuneScape for a minute. But I feel like Elite Dungeons Four was one of the best and well-rounded updates, and maybe you feel different because like the slivers from the dungeon, for example. 
and then having, you know, Inquisitors and whatever the Hex Hunter and the Maul become a little bit more like relative for certain rotations. And I feel like they did a good job like taking old items and making them valuable or like static gloves and stuff. Like, hey, bro, I'll be guarantee when that first updated, there was somebody that had a ton of those just sitting in their bank. Because, you know, a lot of yeah. that stuff went from being worth like 500K to being worth like 50 mil. Yeah, a lot of that stuff really had a, a big jump in price. The same with adding Rex Matriarchs for DK rings. Uh, DKs became a lot more profitable in that regard. And I, I would say that I've really liked it in the past when old content has been is super profitable. Um, for example, when Invention came out, it made a lot of things super profitable. But I know there are a lot of people in the community for whatever reason that have the idea that they would just want, you know, a fresh item. Yeah, it's it. They think it's okay for uh, old items to die. Essentially, I think it's honestly better to have everything have its place and value versus being useless. Uh, and two, while we're on the um, topic of RuneScape, uh, for anybody out there who who is playing, and I know, and I know I've got some players who listen, uh, go check out Joshua's channel. It's just Joshua B on YouTube. Go check him out. He's got awesome progress series. He's way better than me. Um, he's great. So our next question is one that we ask every person that is on question everything. And you know me, I love to blab about them. Do you believe, okay, so it's, I'm going to, it's a long question, but then I'll let you articulate it however you'd like. Do you believe in aliens? If you do believe in aliens, have they visited earth? If you were to spec, and we kind of brushed on this earlier, if you were to speculate what method of propulsion that they would use what do you think it would be? Go ahead. So I do believe in aliens, uh, just because the the universe is so vast. It would it'd be really hard for me to make a solid argument as to why we are special. The Earth is special, for example, when the universe as a whole is so vast. Mm -hmm. Do I think that they have visited Earth in the past? That you know they they possibly could have, but I personally don't see anything that makes me 100% believe that. I feel like the natural evolution of the world can explain almost everything to me. Uh, and then if they were here and that they were, for example, let's say they were leaving Earth and coming back over and over again, I would hope that if it was an advanced species of alien, right? Mm -hmm. that I would hope that us as scientists would have some way of detecting that at this point. I feel like we are hopefully advanced enough that something about the way that they would travel back and forth, that we would be able to detect that. I'm glad that you stated it that way. I had you look up a, a gentleman one day. His name was Travis Walton because I wanted to know – what you thought of his credentials and uh, you cool with me taking a little tangent to chat sure. with you about skinwalker ranch. Cause we, we briefly sure. talked about it one day, but I've been, I'm, I've got a video coming together for it that I'm going to do on the channel, uh, you know, sometime in the future. Okay. Travis Walton. Um, he's got several different degrees. He's a PhD. Uh, you know, I forget the other things, he, communications, um, degree, you know, a lot of different stuff. Very educated guy. Well, uh, he was hired by Brendan Fogel, the owner of Skinwalker Ranch, to basically go out and um, help with the scientific study. Because for those who don't know, Skinwalker Ranch is a ranch in the Uinta Basin. I'm, I'm not sure which state it is. It's either Nevada or Utah, but it, I know it's the Uinta Basin. Well, anyway, long story short, for hundreds of years, it's been a site of kind of like the Bermuda Triangle, lots of weird happenings. Well, anyway, um, in the 90s, Robert Bigelow, the owner of Bigelow Aerospace, who is a contractor for the government and a billionaire, bought Skinwalker Ranch. And a few years, well, 10 years, I think, after he had it, he sold it to the U.S. government and they did experiments. And then Brendan Fogel bought it in 2016. Well, anyway... Long story short, um, you know, there we were kind of talking about detecting their propulsion systems. So there's this th the first two seasons of the show, they didn't find it. But in the third season, they discovered each time these weird phenomena happens, like orbs 
um, literal UFOs in the sky, like glowing lights, uh, what look like portals, all kinds of just insane phenomena. Um, or for example, they were shooting rockets in the air, right. With Geiger counters and several other things on it, uh, you know, with some telemetry stuff. And one of them appears to hit some invisible thing in the sky and like bend around it, for example. Uh, but anyway, there's like this frequency that they detect anytime these phenomena are happening. And Travis Walton's working theory is that this frequency allows them to whatever it is, they're able to cloak themselves. And I think it's more than a cloak. Um, and maybe you can help me break apart the physics of it or what maybe I'm thinking of or how it could be possible, but they essentially phase out of our space time. Like you can't see them. You can't directly interact with them. Um, is there anything in physics that could corroborate that or, you know, make that possible? I know that we were kind of talking about the photon earlier and for people who don't know, that's visible light. Do you think it's possible to, or for, for regular matter to exist at a frequency that you couldn't see or interact with? Uh, so not being able to see it. Yes. Now, like you said, they, according to you, they send something up and it hits something. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, That means that there is something there, so you can interact it with it in some way. You can hit it. Mm -hmm. You can definitely do things that you can't see. For example, uh, you can't see infrared, but right. uh, with our with our eyes, of course, we have cameras that would be able to. But for from what I understand about physics, we do. You, so when you say frequency, you mean like a like a radio frequency. frequency? No, like a a, a radio uh, like FM frequency. Okay. So you're saying something that'd be picked up by a radio. Yeah. Yeah. Like they literally have like, they go to a radio station and even have them replicate the signal back out while they're doing an yeah. experiment. So that's also photons. Photons. Yeah, is Cause all it's just a different band, right? Cause like gamma x-ray, they're all okay. Yeah. And we can develop cameras that would be able to take pictures in certain bands that even that we can't see and so i don't believe that they phase out per se but they could be invisible if they were to phase out they would have to do it in some other way that isn't just going to a different frequency band of light because we have cameras that look at a bunch of different uh, frequency bands, not just the visible light. So, now, there are other things in the world, such as, uh, not in the world, but in the universe, such as dark matter, that don't interact with light at all, right? And then I was and, sit, I was kind of sitting and thinking, yeah. too, if, the, if let's say they are using an Alcubia drive and they're inside their own bubble, hypothetically, though, couldn't that function both as being invisible because the photons aren't hitting it and being able to force an object around it because the bubble itself exists? Does that make any sense? I haven't worked out the exact mechanics of... Okay, so Akubio drives are something that travel... The, the, the bubble itself can have something in it that could outrun a... Could outrun light. That's but without ever of, moving, quote-unquote. Yeah, that, that's the point of an Akubio drive. And I'm wondering if you can send light into it and the light would still reflect back. I'm sure there would be some interesting mechanics there, but going back to gravitational waves, creating an Alcubierre drive, we would be able to probably detect that via LIGO with the gravitational okay. waves. Okay. So but it wouldn't be a frequency, wouldn't be the exhaust per se from it or the, yeah, the detection of it. It wouldn't be, um, yeah, it would, we'd be able to detect gravitational waves because that's what it would be manipulating if it were using an Alcubierre drive. Yeah, and now keep in mind there is dark matter. Dark matter making up more percentage than regular ordinary matter that we deal with. And so, if there was an alien, isn't it had, like isn't it like eighty six percent dark matter and then like ten percent baryonic matter or some something like that? Oh, uh, it's okay. So let's let's see. the The way I remember this is. It's roughly twenty six. 
of out of all the energy and matter in the universe, I think it's twenty percent, uh, twenty six percent of it's dark matter, and about four percent of it is normal matter. The rest is dark energy, and so yeah, the number you might say that you just said I, that might work out, where it's one seventh ordinary matter, which is roughly fourteen percent, which would make dark matter be eighty six percent of the matter. Yeah, okay, that, that works out. Okay, um, but you would imagine that there could be aliens that are made just of dark matter. Now I was I literally know. about to ask you. <laughs> yeah. And because of that, I, because we know so little about dark matter, there's no way for me to be able to say like, Oh yeah. You know, it would be super easy f- for them to, you know, come to us and observe us because I don't know how they would be observing us if they're made of dark matter, because from what we understand, you know, Dark matter is its own separate thing. Like if I threw a baseball out of something made of dark matter, the baseball would just go straight through it. And so I don't know how they would interact with us. Now, we also don't know much about dark matter. So there's plenty there that, you know, it could just be, oh, we just don't understand dark matter well. And as opposed to antimatter, antimatter would just annihilate if you were to touch it, correct? Yep. Okay. And then is is antimatter... Um, th- so with antimatter, are all the particulates or the charges, uh, reverse? Is that the only difference? Uh, yeah. It, okay. That's basically the only so, difference. So you have uh, a positron instead of an electron, for example? Yep. Uh, okay. they have the same mass and everything. It's just that the charge is the opposite of what you would expect. And then I've, I've got to ask you about this too. So do you believe in Bigfoot? And if you do, how much does he bench press? He would definitely bench more than I do. <laughs> but uh, I have no good reason, I feel like, for... I guess I have not been convinced that Bigfoot is a creature that exists currently uh, that is like different than just a, you know, an orangutan or something that someone may have seen because with how thorough human expansion has been and even nowadays with how good of photography and stuff i would have assumed that maybe this is my bias that i believe that humans are really apex on this world uh i would would say that's accurate for sure yeah i would have assumed we would have been able to trap it for example if it were a thing, we would be able to track it, trap it, take photographs of it, that type of thing. So I I will direct um, viewers to my question everything video. So first off, as far as the legitimacy of let's just, let's start with the base. What data do we have to prove that a giant ape creature exists? Okay. So in the 1920s, I believe, right now I don't remember the exact date, a scientist, actually he was a dentist um, in China, but and, and, and an amateur, what is it when you dig, archaeologist, yeah, he was, or paleontologist, yeah, amateur paleontologist, basically discovered the remains of a ape that they ended up calling Gigantopithecus in China. And based on the mandible and the teeth and some other stuff, uh, discovered and then some later remains you're looking at an ape a member of the orangutan family that would be approximately 800 to a thousand pounds fully grown um, and roughly nine feet tall now you do you know what sexual dimorphism is basically like where you know how gorillas uh, male gorillas silverbacks are just so much bigger than females and for the most part humans are like that as well mm-hmm. So I think it's the same thing with the Bigfoot. So as far as that goes, there was an ape creature on Earth that fits the parameters. Now, when it died out, who knows? The next thing I wanted to go to is their hunting strategy. So I would just, for the sake of the conversation, let's assume they're on a relative scale to human intelligence. They're, they're going to understand planning, perhaps. Uh, you know, chimpanzees can hunt in groups. Um, and you know, they make social interactions with each other. They have social order. So let's assume that they do that. Um, allegedly Bigfoot hunt through a strategy called tree peaking and they use tree knocking. So one of the reasons I think it's so hard for us to 
you know, capture of Bigfoot is the fact that they're so good at communicating with each other and they can communicate it without us understanding. And like tree knocking and some other things, people say that they may, you know, speak on a, a spectrum that we can't quite can't hear, maybe a higher or lower frequency, kind of like elephants. Um, but it's one of those things too. We don't find their bodies because humans and even early hominids like um, Neanderthals and then uh, Homo habilis were discovered or there is alleged evidence that they buried their dead. So perhaps, you know, Bigfoot does that as well. Um, if he does exist though, you know, do you think, it would change or what would it take to convince you that Bigfoot exists? Like, would you need one captured? Because there's plenty of video evidence. There's literal hair evidence, um, DNA evidence. And it's yeah, like, I would, I would probably say to have one or multiple captured just because of how good a fake could just, be. Yeah, nowadays it's so hard to know what is fake. Bro, we have AI that can do some crazy, crazy things. Yeah, yeah. It's I I would I would have to say it's probably it would probably require like having one actually captured uh, captured uh, for Um, me to yeah. So and I kind of I actually wasn't going to ask this question, but I think it would be great to ask you as well. what would it take to convince you that aliens are here and exist? Would it be the same thing? You would need to see one in person. Like what would it take? I mean, if we saw the gravitational wave signature of an Alcubia drive right around here, I would be like, okay, there is, there is something going on that we do not understand because that, uh, <laughs> that would definitely spook me. And we don't have to keep, I feel like there is advanced technology that we would, we would be able to be like, Hey, this doesn't make sense. And so if we were to, you know, detect any of that with a, you know, consistent data points. Yeah. So it'd have to happen multiple times for us to have like a consistency of saying, yes, this is definitely happening. Like if we saw them going and leaving a bunch of times, of course we would be able to detect their gravitational wave signatures from like an alcubierre drive or from wormholes, for example. And so if we found a constant, you know, if we saw a bunch of those happening, we'd be able to go, Hey, there is, there is something happening here. Okay. Because it, none of the natural phenomena on earth would explain why we have so many gravitational waves propagating from here. Yeah. If we, if we had very clear, Hey, there's alcubierre drives starting to appear and we're detecting them and, Of course, one of the things is we can make a rough estimate of how close it would be, and we would be able to say, hey, it seems like it would be fairly close, for example, because gravitational waves get weaker as they propagate through uh, space-time. And sorry if I'm holding you up too long. Is there a redshift to gravitational waves? Because I'm just curious how we... Okay, I was just wondering, I'm like, well, how would we know how far away it was unless there was some kind of redshift? There's redshift, but there is also the fact that... um, it gets weaker over time. And that's the same thing that happens with, for example, our uh, pressure wave uh, sound. For example, when you talk to someone from far away, uh, it's much quieter. And that's the same thing that would happen. Uh, so that, that just made me actually kind of have another idea about why I think maybe LIGO couldn't detect uh, ET yet. So, um, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard these like fun facts, like a, a neutron star, one teaspoon of neutron star matter would weigh as much as every locomotive on earth, you know, like how dense they are. Wouldn't, yeah, I mean, wouldn't know a craft. Do you say more than that? Yeah. It might even weigh more than that. But isn't, yeah. isn't a uh, black hole matter, like uh, something the size of a softball would be the entire earth's mass. I can actually work that out real quick. It's called the Schwartz Shield sure. Radius. Uh, Schwartz Shield. Yes. Um, Is that different it, from the Schwartz Shield metric? So the Schwartz Shield metric is the how space time. What is like the distance in space time around? Um, around 
uh, something like a black hole, which is non-rotating, a non-rotating black hole, mm -hmm. the Schwarzschild radius is how much you'd have to condense something for it to be, uh, to, for it to become a black hole. And so for Earth, if you were to make Earth into a black hole, the black hole would be less than a centimeter in radius. Oh my god. So like a marble or a bean. Yeah, just, yeah you <laughs> essentially convert Earth into uh, a marble. It's just kind of horrifying to think about, like, just everything we know condensed into that. And, uh, man, the universe is a wonderful thing. And, honestly, it's why I love physics so much. I I truly hope that, like, you know, us having this conversation, even if it's literally a single person that listens to this and it sparks, like, a love for physics, you know, then it's it's all worth it. Well, brother, you know, I've, I've kept you for over an hour today. Um, again, let me let me give everybody your socials. Uh, Joshua B., check him out on YouTube. Follow his RuneScape series. He also does powerlifting. We didn't even get to talk about powerlifting today. But to be honest, you know, we're good friends. I'm sure you may, you know, come back on and chat with me sometime. Um, yep. You know, and we can talk about some more cool stuff. But, bro, thank you for your time, man. Uh, and I hope you have a good evening. You too. Thank you All for having me. Yep. Later, bro.